Fungi are changing the world around us and hardly any of us even know it. We use them in building materials, we eat them, and we create powerful medicines with them. And they have been around for hundreds of millions of years. Last century gave us some of our greatest technologies, the internet, space travel, advanced medicine, and nuclear energy. This century, we are approaching innovation in a much more refined and efficient manner. We're coming to an age of biotechnology, where we will be harnessing the billions of years of evolution that nature has to offer. All around us, there is an astonishing amount of complex biological machines with technological capabilities far beyond anything we have invented. Today, I want to share with you why I find fungal machines so fascinating by giving you a broad overview of some of the things they do and some of the things they may do in the future. Fungi have their own kingdom of life, separate from plants and animals. Many people think of mushrooms as fungi. The mushroom, though, is just the sexual organ that some fungi species produce. It creates spores similar to seeds and plants. The majority of the fungus is in this complex, interconnecting web of microscopic threads called hyphae. These hyphae can extend great distances in soil. And in fact, the largest organism in the world is a fungus, stretching 3.8 kilometers in the US state of Oregon. We have classified around 100,000 or so fungi species, but we believe there are millions. Without fungi, life as we know it would cease to exist. They're the primary decomposers of organic material resulting in soil, making much of life possible. They do this by acting like a kind of stomach in the soil, excreting enzymes, creating food for plants and animals. Some fungi also create quite intriguing relationships with plants known as a mycorrhizae. These relationships are present in over 90% of plants and are usually mutually beneficial, where the plant gives carbon through photosynthesis to the plant in exchange for phosphates and other molecules that aren't readily available in the soil. This underground fungal network is referred to experts in the field as the wood wide web. <laughs> this analogy comes from the way in which these fungal networks interconnect trees in an ecosystem, acting like a kind of biological superhighway of information similar to the internet. Fungi are also a great source of drugs. Not those kind of drugs, but... <laughs> Penicillin, which revolutionized modern medicine with its life-saving antibiotic properties, saving millions, and the reason many of us in this very room are alive today, actually came from a green mold fungus you've probably all seen before growing on citrus. We have utilized what fungi do best for many centuries. Fungal yeasts make our bread, beer, and wine. Blue cheeses get their color and flavor from fungi. And even an Australian staple, Vegemite, uses fungal yeast in its production. The mold you've seen before growing in the fruit occurs because fungi are practically inescapable. They're everywhere, so much so that Many of them even live on and in our own bodies, making up crucial aspects of our bioflora, making you, you. As a young teenager, when I got a fascination in fungi, my parents were quite concerned. I started growing fungi in my bedroom when I was about 16. <laughs> this concern comes from a stigma that is held against mushrooms, that they are often either poisonous or contain psychoactive properties. I got passionate about fungi as a teenager when I came across the work by mycologist Paul Stamets. He views fungi as the immune system of the natural world that help maintain our biosphere and prevent ecological collapse. He noticed as a young scientist that fungi act like a kind of biological filter in the soil. When taken out of the soil and grown in a lab, he showed that these filters are capable of removing bacterial, nitrogenous, and other contaminants, such as heavy metals from runoff, say next to a storm, storm drain or farm. He's also done some quite fascinating work on remediating damaged environments using fungi. He showed that the common oyster mushroom, something you can find at the local supermarket, is capable of breaking down complex hydrocarbons, such as oil, turning an uninhabitable landscape into a thriving rich medium in as little as 16 weeks. 
This process can also be applied to water bodies where the fungal mats can be floated in a stream and mop up oil spills. Also, on the topic of remediation, radiotrophic fungi, meaning fungi that can convert radiation into chemical energy, could be used to help rehabilitate areas such as Fukushima. Another common waste, plastic, can also be a sole food source for a fungus that was found in the Amazon several years ago. Now, commercializing scientific discoveries can be challenging, and this is something I'm quite interested in. But when it occurs, beautiful things happen. An example being a company in the US that has commercialized a quite novel and interesting biotechnology using fungi. They have developed a self-assembling biopolymer that is entirely made from combining agricultural waste with fungal tissues. The resulting product being a light, foamy, polystyrene-like material that sells as a natural packaging. It can also be further manipulated, say, through compression, to make a more dense, engineered wood-like product, the kind of thing you would find maybe at IKEA. These materials are fully flame-retardant, they're great insulators, and only take around five to seven days to grow. In principle, you could grow a table in this short amount of time. They also don't contain any toxic byproducts such as formaldehyde that is commonly found in many engineered wood products that are toxic to you and the environment. To show off this material, a 12 meter high tower was built last year in New York, entirely made from fungi grown blocks. These materials get their structural properties from a polymer in the fungal cell wall known as chitin. Some fungi instead, though, produce a polymer called chitazan instead of chitin. As a student here in Perth, I've been quite interested in exploring this antibacterial and biodegradable polymer for its broader applications. It is already used as a biopesticide in agriculture, in water treatment plants to clear water, and is heavily used in biomedical science. Its compatibility with the human body makes it an ideal candidate for 3D printed organs, which is a quite exciting and upcoming technology. It is also heavily used as a mechanism to deliver drugs and genes. It can also be spun into a fiber resembling cotton. It has a quite similar structure to cellulose, so it's quite easy and non-disruptive to that industry. Its antibacterial properties makes this fabric anti-odor and useful in preventing hospital-acquired infections. It also has hemostatic properties, which I've been exploring quite recently, which means it can bind to and coagulate red blood cells producing a clot in seconds rather than minutes, preventing blood loss and infection, and ultimately saving lives. The next part is something that I study here at Perth. I study biotechnology and genetics. I'm really interested in how these fungal properties that I've mentioned today can be further improved by this process, by genetically engineering them. Just several weeks ago, a genetically engineered fungal yeast strain capable of producing morphine from glucose, was published in the journal Nature. This process could make it possible to produce powerful drugs as simply as brewing beer. We know so little about fungi, and we're only scratching the surface of what they can offer us. Threats such as climate change and land clearing are losing us many of these valuable biological machines. They are our and nature's companions and they are crucial to managing our ecosystems all around the world. If we fail to embrace these organisms for their building materials, life-saving properties, and clothing, I think that we will be in great peril. Thank you.